Um, yeah, so that's pretty cool. Um, now, do we want to talk about the diffuse interstellar bands? Or do we oh, not? the self-preservation of grass. <laughs> The self-preservation of grass. Fantastic. Okay, we will move on to uh, chat about some of the Cyblogs articles this week. Uh, this week is a slightly shorter podcast, but we think that's okay. Um, so, Calvin, tell us about the self-preservation of grass. Well, it's the smell of grass. Ah. The smell of cut grass um, is is actually grass sending a message. It's telling insects to bugger off. Uh, I've got some healing to do. Absolutely. <laughs> Essentially, yeah, I've simplified things a little bit there, but the, <laughs> the chemical it gives off um, wards off insects, and uh, which is a good thing. It I, means when the grass is damaged, it's keeping other forms of damage away. Yeah, like chomping and things. Uh, so this was a post literally called The Self-Preservation of Grass, written by Bridget Gallagher, who is the blogger behind Digging the Dirt. Um, Bridget often talks about sort of things archaeological, but has branched out into things grassy. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know the word for that. Um, so the name of the, um, the compound that we like the smell of, that, that sort of freshly mowed lawn smell, other than the pretzel you can probably smell, uh, is called coumarin. Yeah. Uh, but but uh, So C-O-U-M-A-R-I-N. Yeah, it's uh, benzopyrone. Um, and it's apparently commonly added to pipe tobacco and some alcoholic drinks to lure us into partaking. I know. I was trying to think when I read that whether I've ever drunk anything that smelled like grass other than some of the Sauvignon Blancs that you can get in New Zealand. And um, But I don't know if you're allowed to, to add things to wine here. I wouldn't think so. I wouldn't have thought so either. So I'm not sure what people are drinking, but it's certainly intriguing. I may have to go down to the local liquor store and, and say, Tell me about your coumarin infused Yes, liquors. but our, our history with alcohol is a strange one. We've made every form of alcohol. We've put everything into alcohol that we possibly could, this I think, as humans. Well, yeah. Probably including humans throughout time. Oh, God. Well, the, the occasional scrumpy vet gone horribly wrong. I mean, if you can put a sheep head in it, right. Anyway, moving along swiftly, we apologize to uh, those of us. Brewer listeners. falls in occasionally. <laughs> Uh, the brewer doesn't know the scrumpy's <laughs> like that. Uh, Scrumpy really is like that for anybody who's not had it. It's fantastic stuff. Uh, we're talking proper British scrumpy here, not the new yeah, the, uh, weird, horrible. Well, stuff. if it fizzes, it's not scrumpy. No, if if it dissolves straight through, you know, any tin. Yeah. It's scrumpy. It's scrumpy. Yeah. Yeah. If you can see through it, it's not scrumpy. <laughs> if your legs still work, it's <laughs> not scrumpy. Uh, if you can remember having drunk it, <laughs> it's not, it's not scrumpy. Uh, a fun little uh, story here is Douglas Adams, who wrote The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, uh, actually came up with the idea while lying very, very inebriated in an English field, having partaken of rather too much cider that night. I, yeah, I got engaged once because of scrumpy. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. All right. We all have scrumpy <laughs> damage stories. <laughs> we really do. Um, okay, so there's there's that one. Um, we'll also just check quickly. Oh, yeah, this is quite cool. Um, so this is from uh, Ken Parrott, who writes the Open Parachute blog on Cyblogs. And it's just, it's more of a heads up than anything else to a competition being run by the Otago University Center for Science Communication. And it's a Twitter competition. And... The entry um, is limited to, I think you get one tweet, and you've got to explain the origins of the universe, which sounds like dead good fun. So deadline is Tuesday the 15th of November. I'm going to immediately start thinking about yes. things to send in. The, the origins of the universe in 140 characters or less. Can it just be a bitly to, <laughs> <laughs> to an animation that oh I do? Oh my, there's probably a pun about like bitly, stuffly, you know, feedly, God knows. Um, that, that would be pretty cool. I'm having a look at some of the tweets coming in uh, at the moment, if you go onto the um, Center for Science Communication website. <laughs> okay, some people are sending in silly ones, but... Um, wow. In fact, peering back through time are clues starlight dust and the movement of galaxies to try and play it all forwards again. That's interesting. Uh, then why are nothing, nothing, wow, everything? <laughs> I like... I, you don't need 140 characters. I, I can do it in so. two words. Yep, tell Stuff it. happened. <laughs> Indeed. Um, so, so we'll look forward to, to seeing who wins those. Um, you can go and vote for your favorite as well if you don't want to submit anything, but, but submit. Tweet competitions are fun. 
Um, and then the last uh, side blog, um, uh, well, blog post we'll chat about is a post by Alison Campbell. She writes Bioblog, and this is called Visualizing a Curriculum. Um, and very briefly, uh, she, she goes beautifully into sort of the thought process of the round it is she's realized that possibly the course curriculum, the syllabus that they hand to students, um, which are often very text heavy, they use a lot of technical terms, they're written by people who know the material inside and out, the teachers. She's realized that a lot of students may actually be battling to understand them and to understand their re relevance because they don't know about the subject. It's why they're taking well, the course. Well, they're, they're written by a generation who was raised on linear books yeah. with lots of words in. Yeah. Uh, also by a, a generation who put a lot of value on being able to write long-winded, very, <laughs> very... You know, technical things. Yeah, the the more complex they could make it, the the higher they would vote themselves at the science ladder to a certain extent. Yeah. And here we are in a generation where the web has taken us the other way in our writing. Simple simple writing now is seen as as a value. Mm. And um, we have media which can be hyperlinked, so yeah. we don't have to explain everything. We can just simply leave links. Mm -hmm. And also, we have other ways of explaining things which give context. We could put uh, this data together into a mind map, for exactly. instance, yeah. to show connection and context. And there's so much better ways of presenting information these days. You can make oh, it move, oh, yeah. you can bring it to life. Mm. And seeing as a picture can paint a thousand words, uh, you can cut thousands and thousands of words <laughs> out. <laughs> Precisely. So Alan Allison is going to um, look at designing a syllabus, a, a course outline for her students that is more visual, that's going to be more about a concept um, map sort of idea, mm. and and there will be links, um, obviously, to, to other things, and, and the idea will be that it will explain to the students um, not only what the course is all about, but also how it all fits together, how it links to material they've already learned into future courses, so they're going to get a far more, uh, I, I, well, I'm going to use the word holistic, a far more holistic understanding of where the course, or, sorry, in New Zealand they call it a paper, where the paper yeah. fits into their general education, which I think is brilliant. Uh, this, this sounds very like... Um, the small chunk of the the Khan Academy, which has been codified into um, a a two way learning process thing, um, KhanAcademy.org is an excellent site for learning primarily maths, but mm. many many other subjects now. There's over two and a half thousand videos there that Salman Khan has put up himself. Wow. But what's really cool is there's a series of about fifty or sixty exercises to start teaching you maths. And it's all laid out in a tree form, and it starts with addition. Nice. <laughs> and then you start, you know, you start learning how to subtract, to then multiplication. Um, it's well worth looking at the alternative method for multiplication that he gives oh. as a paper and pencil method, because it's way better than what we were taught at school. Fascinating. Um, oh, but he, the, when it initially launched, uh, they had a very simplistic method of determining when you could move on to the next unit. And that was if you could get 10 in a, in a row right. The, the concept behind it is that you, you're showing mastery. Mm -hmm. And that until, you, until you've mastered something, you shouldn't move on. Because if you do, you're less likely to understand the next thing and the next thing. Absolutely. But and that's, the, that's a constant problem in maths. With yeah. People not having good foundations and then they fall over later and yeah. it's too late to fix it and then suddenly they think they, they, they crap at maths and they crap at numbers. So what this has done is, is it allows the, the pupil to see what they've got ahead of them, a network of things that are all interconnected. You can't learn X without having learned Y and Z before, you know, beforehand. Mm -hmm. um, so you get to see where you are within this tree. It's a bit like... Um, the, the skills dependency in civilization or something like that. <laughs> yeah. And I think over the next few years, what we're going to see is, is a codifying of all knowledge mm. into a tree like that, showing all the dependencies so people can see where they are. They can view a network of knowledge 
and go, oh, I know that small chunk there, and get a, it gives, it gives a, a sense of scale, get a, mm. a sense of context, mm. which you never really get when you just fed textbook after textbook in that mm. old-fashioned way. Absolutely. And you don't understand, you know, if, if I decided that I wanted to know X, Y, Z, with, without a good understanding of how it all fits together, it's very possible to go down the wrong road. Or not to get there at all, or not to understand. Or to yeah. misunderstand. Or to, misunderstand, to really it, badly misunderstand. Which we see a lot with science as well. Mm. Mm. So, um, so yes, that, that basically uh, uh, is, is most of our discussion for, for today. Um, I'll just quickly go through a couple of the events that are coming up this week. What have we got? There's the Otago International Health Research Network Conference in Dunedin this week. That should be interesting if you're into that sort of thing. Um, there is, ah, the New Zealand Coastal Society Annual Conference is happening at the moment. That's in Tahuna Beach Holiday Park in Nelson. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> They'll be having a nice time. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, then there are a couple of talks. There's Emily Parker's Wonderful World of Enzymes at Auckland. Oh, that now, sounds fantastic. That would be great. Enzymes are, are just the most phenomenal proteins. They're, they're responsible for doing everything. They're, they're, well, yeah. They, are they your favorite protein? One of, our, one of my favorite classes of protein, absolutely. You, yeah, <laughs> I got all sort of starry-eyed about them. Cool. Um, for anybody who doesn't know, I used to study microbiology, so I spent a fair amount of time with them. Um, there's also uh, the uh, Murray Curie lecture, The Light Fantastic, by Dr. Kath Cather Simpson. I'm thinking Catherine Simpson. That's at the University of Canterbury, um, and so she's going to be talking, I'm assuming she, I'm sorry if it's a he, going to be talking about um, light and converting light into a uh, form of energy that we can use very easily. So that should be fascinating. Yeah. Um, get down to that if, if you have any chance to. What have we got? Uh, then, then there's death studies in Aotearoa, New Zealand. That's in Hamilton on Friday. Uh, it sounds cheerful but interesting. And I thought for a second that I misheard that for a second as Death Star Studies. <laughs> and then, Which, once again, it, it, pointing lots of lasers in one small space. Yeah, absolutely. Um, We've oh, got full circle. Mine, I'm thinking of a completely unrepeatable joke that was doing the rounds this week. I'll tell Delvin afterwards with featuring a Death Star and, and stuff. It was. <laughs> It's very silly, but probably not appropriate for this. Um, then there's also, uh, later in the week, there's a conference on music therapy, um, which is also a pretty interesting field. It's not one I know much about, but it does seem to be pretty valid. Well, I, I, uh, I know very little about it uh, on an intellectual level, but on a personal level, I'm, uh, you know, uh, one of my only forms of true stress relief is banging the snot out of drums. <laughs> I think it works that way for a lot. Playing guitar really, really loud, mm, mm. Uh, and it does it. It's it's one of the few really grrr, emotional releases that that um, a, a geek gets. Absolutely, yeah. You can't go out and hit stuff, or you know, play rugby. Well, you can, but it's unusual. <laughs> Many people don't want to. Right. Well, uh, that that concludes us for the day. Um, I'll say thank you to Calvin for coming along this uh, week. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Um, and thank you to the Science Media Centre for the use of their gear um, and to Ruin Sheehan for the use of this music. Uh, goodbye. Check out the episode links on cyblogs.co.nz forward slash and we'll chat next week. Bye-bye.